The first approach I would name the no particular problem approach. That's the one that traditionally was adopted by the UK before the directive was issued, and which seems to be, and I'm uncertain here, but there seems to be the, the prevailing situation in Hong Kong as well, if the literature I read is correct. The model lacks a general rule on unfairness of contracts, as the law should uh, recognize what the parties have agreed on without fraud, fraud or force as a just solution. Only for particular situation or issues, the law might di direct the courts to disregard the terms of the agreements. We have different, different uh, doctrines for particular si situations like frustration or whatever. And we have, of course, the, the, the uh, in UK, the Unfair Contracts Terms Act from 1977, which fits very well into this model as well, as it does not, despite its name, contain a general rule on unfairness, but it is only applicable was, uh, to, to exemption clauses. This is the traditional way of, of, of common law to look at the issue. The second way of looking at the issue is particularly focused on the fairness problems related to the use of standard form contracts. The philosophy behind this approach could be described as an attempt to take the justifications for the binding force of contracts seriously. If we think that, that the reason for holding contracts binding in the first place is the consent of the parties, that is really the, the, the basic reason. The will, the consent, how do you, uh, you can describe it in many ways. Then situations where you read you standard for contracts perhaps not even read by the other party are somehow problematic in 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 this in this uh, uh, way of, of of understanding contracts there's no real consent from the other party and therefore one thinks that the law, the law may might have has uh, have to intervene and i i think the internationally paradigmatic example of this kind of approach was the German Act on General Conditions from 1976, which was later included as a part of the German Civil Code as well. But that, that, that was, of course, there were general clauses, other general clauses in German law as well. I must say that because we have a German lawyer in the audience, but, but, but this was kind of the paradigmatic, the thing which, which was kind of very, very typical and most discussed in, in the German approach. That was flaws of the will. The third way was, was to look at the, at the balance of power between the parties. Some were stronger, some were weaker, and, 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 and a kind of acknowledge that, that the stronger parties in the, in the market could kind of force their will on, on the weaker parties and it needed law to protect in some ways the weaker parties. And the main reason for rules concerning unfairness of contracts in this approach would be, would be protection of weaker parties, like consumer protection, you could also have other groups of, of, of weaker parties. So the application of the rules in this context which would be delimited usually to B2C business to consumer relations and perhaps to similar relationships between stronger and weaker parties. A good example of, of this kind of approach you would find in, in French law, for instance, where, where, the consumer, where, where the unfairness rules were, were contained in the consumer protection. Uh, legislation. And then you have the going from the no particular problem to the other extreme. The other extreme is probably the, the Nordic countries to which Finland also belongs. This fourth approach looks at unfairness of contracts in, a, in the most comprehensive way, including the perspectives of both the standard form contract and the consumer protection models, and extending them in principle 
to cover the whole area of contract law. One might call this the general fairness approach. The Nordic Contracts Act includes an internationally well-known rule in, in section, section 36, according to which a court may, may set aside or adjust a contract term if its application leads to unfair results. And this provision is applicable both to consumer contracts and to B2B relationships. And it covers both standard form contracts and individually negotiated contracts. And, and how could you then possibly uh, justify such an approach? This kind of approach, I think, is based on the recognition that contracting can lead to unfair results in all kinds of relationships and with regard to all kinds of terms, and on the understanding that the court system of a just state should not be used to enforce unf unfairness. I think that is a basic, basic thinking counter that you should not use the courts to, to, to put through unfair, unfair things, so to say. And then, of course, it's a question where you put the, put the level of unfairness. So, we have at had at least four different approaches. If you would go into detail, you would find several more, but four basic approaches in Europe with regard to the regulation of unfairness. And it was a, a, this, this was, of course, a, a, a some, somewhat of a challenge for the European drafting legisla legislator who wanted to harmonize the area. Uh, it was, of course, somewhat easier that in, perhaps in theory these were big differences. In practice, there were not that large differences because in 99.9% .9 of all cases, contract terms are, are followed like that. It's, 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 we are dealing with marginal, marginal cases anyway. But it has also, also in the directive, been solved by two moves which made the directive acceptable and easy to implement for member states with provisions based on, on the second, third and fourth approach here. The European directive focused on the more, most important group of cases, that is consumer contracts based on standard forms or not individually uh, negotiated terms. Uh, and left out others outside the scope of the directive. So it, it fit kind of a, fits a, 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 a combined German-French model. But the directive was also made a minimum directive, so member states could go further, have stricter rules if they wished to. So that in, made it very easy for, for also for the Nordics to accept the, the, the directive. So the amendments of national laws because of the directive were in many cases of, of minor importance because the national laws, all, all these different models kind of fit, fitted into this minimum directive. Only in the UK uh, you needed, the, the legislation needed more thorough changes which were affected, as I said, by the unfair con uh, terms in consumer contracts regulation. Uh, it forced English law in a way to recognize, re reconsider its view expressed as recently as 1992 in Walford and Miles, which said that the doctrine of good faith is inherently repugnant to the adversarial position of the parties and unworkable in practice. That was in 1992, but 1999, the, the UK get this unworkable legislation effected. The basic rule of the directive is a general clause which says, says that a contractual term which has not been individually negotiated should be regarded as unfair if, contrary to the requirement of good faith, it causes a significant imbalance of the party's rights and obligations. And then there's uh, some, some uh, other delimitations of scope as well, which I, I want to go into here. 
And this is, as I said, the directive that has forced English law to change. And the thinking is now suggested to be brought from the UK to Hong Kong. How has it managed to perform its European task? To what extent has it harmonized European unfair contract terms law? And to what extent is it still more adequate to speak about, for example, UK law or English law than of European law? Is there a joint European fairness doctrine as a consequence of this directive? Well, the easy answer is no. It's easy to see that the directive has not been able to introduce a joint European approach to the issue of unfair contract terms. Uh, the idea of an area in which standard conditions could move freely across the borders with similar legal consequences has not materialized. Already the fact that the scope of the directive is limited to consumer contracts leaves a wide field of contracts outside the scope and, and business to business con contracts are dealt with in a very different ways in different countries, as I said already. Uh, but this, and I will note that later, does not mean that the issue of European rules in this area has not been discussed, but, and I think there might be emerging a joint European fairness doctrine covering the B2B area as well, as I will see, we will see later. And the fact that the fairness assessment of the directive according to a particular rule cannot be applied to contract terms that have been individually negotiated, to contract terms that relate to the definition of the main subject matter of the contract, and to terms relating to the adequacy of the price and remuneration, does not preclude national fairness rules that cover such indiv individual terms. So in, also in, in, in this area we have many dif national variations and we have good cases also accepting, accepting these variations. The only, only rule we have is really an information rule. The Commission did not really like the, the situation that that the, the, the European member states were still of very dif had a very different approach to the unfairness issue, despite the, the directive. So they wanted to make re redraft the situation and make the directive a maximum directive, which would would kind of force the, the European uh, member states to to bring down the level to the same level from both from both directions, but that did not go through. It was too, too much opposition from, from the member states. So the only compromise that was reached was, was that in a new directive on consumer rights, uh, there is a, 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 a rule that a member state that adopts provisions extending the unfairness assessment to individually negotiate, con negotiated contractual terms or to the adequacy of the price of remuneration shall inform the EU Commission thereof, and this information shall, shall be made accessible to consumers and traders on a dedicated website. So I, I mention this because, again, the goal of this, this rule is transparency. The businesses and consumers of the Union should be aware of the possibilities to legally interfere against unfairness within the various member states. So we also on this level we see that the EU legislation reflects a strong belief in the value of transparency. And I will return to this later. But in other words, it seems that the basic variation in starting points that member states had in the national laws, it continues. The unfairness rules in different member states have, have different scopes. But what about the, the core, the, 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 the situation where, where we should have similar rules, that is consumer, consumer contracts 
with standard terms or not individually negotiated terms. There, the directive covers all the European member states. Has a joint understanding concerning unfairness emerged in this area as a consequence of the directive? Again, the first and kind of uh, preliminary answer would be no. Not even in this core area of the directive is there a very joint, uh, is there a joint unfairness doctrine. Much of the assessment of unfairness is left to the national courts. And this is very clearly stated in the European Court of Justice case Freiburger Kommunalbauten, which is mentioned on, on, the, on the slide, the, the ECJ stated that even though it could interpret general criteria to define the concept of unfair terms, it should not, however, rule on the application of those general criteria to a particular term, which must be considered in the light of the particular circumstances of the case in question. So each national court have to, have to do the assessment of the particular term in relationship to the basic rules of, of, of that national legal system. And we have a lot of other cases in the ECG which has followed up this case law. And we have many national courts who gladly have made use of the leeway this decision offers them to make their own assessments of unfairness. Fairness assessment is still to a large extent made on national level and with different basis, basic ideologies, one cannot expect identical practical results. And I, I may, cannot refrain from here mentioning the, the very well-known UK, UK case of First National Bank, bank from the House of Lords that clearly avoided too much Europeanization of the issue. Lord Bingham stated expressly, I cite, the member states have no common concept of fairness of good or good faith, and the directive does not purport to state the law of any single, single member state. But having said this, I note that this was only the preliminary, preliminary uh, uh, statement, the preliminary development, so to say, the first 20 years of, of the directive or the first 15 years of the directive. There are growing signs concerning a turn towards the develop, development of more joint European standards now. We have a lot of, of new European Court of Justice cases that seem to include more and more concrete guidelines for the interpretation of the general clause in the directive. I mentioned here as a, as a good case, the Banco Popular case from 1912, in which the court underlined uh, 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 and uh, which argument it considered to be of decisive importance when uh, applying the general clause. And there are, I will come back in the next slide, to several other cases which uh, relate to the role of the active consumer that uh, also seem to uh, clearly attempt to develop a separate European, joint European doctrine of fairness. At the moment, the situation is kind of turning, so to say. At the moment, we perhaps do not yet have joint fairness rules, not even in the core of, of the fairness directive. But we have a, what, what we have, what we do have, is a shared debate. And I think already that is an advantage. It makes the whole system more transparent. The possibilities of contracting parties to know and understand the working of contract law in different member states has increased 
even if we do not have a joint fairness doctrine, we have a joint, at least partially, a joint fairness discourse. And this is, of course, important to take into account if one com contemplates the introduction of UK measures in Hong Kong law. UK law in this area, even though not completely harmonized with the law of other European countries, cannot be understood without its European context. And this is growing in, import, in importance. I will mention now some examples. 